Let me give you a definition of cloud computing. Let's boil this thing down to its essence, right? And every word of this definition is an important one. And I won't over dissect it, but I want you to understand a few things about the cloud that aren't necessarily apparent when you first think about it. Right? The first one is that it is intelligent. The cloud is not about a bunch of data centers. The cloud has an intelligence about it. And I'll talk about this in just a minute because the traditional notion of the cloud is so far off from what actually is happening in the cloud that I, it's shocking to most people that we're that far behind the curve in terms of how well we understand this. Always available, no matter where you are, uh, no matter what pipes you have to provide you with access to the data or the information or the people. And it's hardware, software, and programming. Most of us think of the cloud, we think of software as a service. We don't think of people as a service. But people as a service is as much a part of the cloud as any of the rest of this is. So all of this purchased as and when needed. Here's one important aspect of that that often gets lost. As and when needed based on the risk you're willing to assume. See, up until now, investing in IT has been asymmetrical. asymmetric. You have to invest more often than the risk you're willing to assume. The key in the cloud is that you invest to the degree that you're willing to assume risk. You got that? Because we're going to go much further into this, and it's really important to understand that when I talk about the cloud, you know, it's going to be tough to narrow this down in the context of this discussion, but there are really all sorts of different clouds. We hear about private clouds and public clouds, hybrid clouds, consumer clouds, enterprise clouds, small business clouds. And to each one of these communities, there's a different motivating factor, but there are some that underlie all of them. So let's start by asking the obvious question, why the cloud? Why not use what we have already? What we have seems to be working pretty well, by and large. The first megatrend that is leading to the cloud, the driver that I see that is first and foremost, is that of uncertainty. The generalized uncertainty in the context of virtually everything we do from a personal standpoint, from a professional standpoint, all of these create barriers to progress, barriers to innovation. The cloud removes those barriers by creating predictability where there was uncertainty. Stick with me because this is something which most folks don't even talk about when they talk about cloud or cloud computing. The reason for the cloud is to counterbalance the tremendous weight of uncertainty. And I see this with hundreds of organizations from the large companies like Intel that I work with to the small startups that I work with. They're all obsessed with how they can mitigate uncertainty and create greater predictability in their world. The VCs I work with, similarly obsessed with uncertainty and how they can mitigate the degree to which they invest in companies in an uncertain financial climate. So how does the cloud help you to handle uncertainty? So let's go through two courses of cloud economics. We'll start with cloud economics 101. And we'll go back to dad's half full, half empty glass. So today, if each of these glasses was a company with IT resources, each one could be considered half full or half empty. Why? Well, because you need more IT than the processes that you have to run on it because you've got to make sure that you've got enough IT to handle the capacity when it's at a peak load. So you're a small company, you know, you don't want to buy a whole lot of hardware and invest in a lot of software, but you sort of have to because you can't buy it piecemeal. So you got more hardware and you got more software than you need. And by the way, you have to keep buying it every so often to stay current. So what if I were to take, this is 101, okay? This is sort of the conventional view of the cloud. And I'll tell you something, it is the most flawed explanation of cloud computing you are ever going to get. But it is the most prevalent explanation. Why don't we just create one big drinking glass? We'll call it a utility, like an electric company. And if we divvy up, all the resources and allow people to plug in to the degree of computing that they need, whether it's software or hardware, a data center, storage, well, then it costs a whole lot less. And they're better off, aren't they? Because they don't have to use their individual overbuilt systems. They don't have to worry about not having enough computing capacity or enough storage or enough horsepower. Wrong. This is not the cloud. This is virtualization, this is what we've had for the last 20 years. This is why when Ellison says, what the hell's new about the cloud? This is what he's referring to. This is not the cloud. This is just an evolution of computing. So what is the cloud? 
Well, the cloud is taking this same infrastructure and saying, you know what, rather than just create a utility, what if I were to intelligently, remember that word from the definition? Intelligently de de decide what each of those companies or processes is trying to do, and then what if I were to refactor that request for services, for people, for hardware, in such a way that I intelligently actually change the code so that it's more efficient, more effective. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of you have very graphic intensive applications, so you need an NVIDIA card or something to speed up your machine. Well, what if you don't have a graphic accelerator in your machine? What do you do? You buy a bigger machine? Well, what if I could take your request that requires graphic acceleration, refactor it, and decide, you know what? That server or virtual server up in the upper right there, it's really good at graphics. It can work with graphics. I'll send that request to that server. That's cloud computing. And, and what I rarely hear, I mean, if I, if I hear someone talk about cloud computing 100 times, if I'm lucky once, I'll hear them talk about refactoring. Refactoring is it's the heart and soul of cloud computing. If you're talking about the cloud and you're not talking about refactoring, the intelligence that allows you to reconstruct that code base, that request, in a more efficient way, you're not talking about the cloud. So give up this notion of the utility as being the benefit of the cloud. The benefit of the cloud is intelligently parsing through what you are asking for and sending it back out. So what's the big deal? Well, take that same concept, refactoring specifically, and I'll show you two examples of where that was used that are both pretty mind-boggling. One was the New York Times, which wanted to convert its 11 million archived articles and images into PDF format. Internal IT said it's going to take us a number of weeks to do it. One employee, using a few EC2 instances on Amazon, did it for 300 bucks in 24 hours. That's refactoring. I'll give you another example of it. Anyone here use Animoto? Animoto.com? So one of the things that we do at Delphi, because of my speaking, is we produce a lot of promotional videos of me speaking. And it's very expensive to do this stuff. It'll cost you from ten dollars to $20,000 to produce this very basic promotional video. And uh, I got back from ILTA last year, and one of our folks in, in our IT web group said, hey, you know, I came across this really cool thing. I'm going to throw some of your video and some of your photographs at it, and it's going to produce for free a uh, montage video of you speaking. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, tell me about it. Let's see what it can do. Here's what it did. The company's called Animoto. When it launched, it had 50 servers. Within just a few days, it was up to 35,000 servers because the thing became so popular. So our IT got a bunch of videos, a bunch of photos of me, literally threw them at the engine, didn't architect anything, just said, here are the photos, optimize it as you like, do what you want for transitions. Here's some text and, and didn't even worry about font styles or anything. And as a result, they produced this five minute video clip that you're seeing here. No one produced this. The cloud produced this. So remember what I said earlier, the cloud is about programming. It's about what people do today. This is something that will be enormously people intensive, done completely in the cloud. Could not be done without this notion of refact refactoring. Could not be done without it. If you don't refactor, you don't have the intelligence to be able to create something this sophisticated. Now, I said for free, we got an HD version of this that cost us, I think, 45 bucks, right? As opposed to 20,000, which is what the last speaker's video cost us. This is how drastically and how disruptively things are changing. So when you look at what you're doing in IT today, it's not a one order of magnitude or a two order of magnitude. This is a three order of magnitude difference in terms of the cost and the time. But when I think, so where does all this lead us, right? Where does the cloud ultimately take us individually, organizationally, as a, as a society? Well, let me, let me share with you three visions of the future. And some of these I've already alluded to, so they shouldn't come as a surprise. But the first is that you can completely forget about the whole notion of forgetting. Because the cloud will have perfect memory. Right? Everything it captures will be there forever. Perfect memory. And, and you know, today we struggle with that because we think, what if? 
people knew what I did when I was young. But what we leave out of that thought is, what if I knew what everyone else did when they were young? And if we know what we all did when we were all young, we're on a level playing field. It doesn't much matter anymore. And that's the way these kids are looking at it. It just doesn't matter. Because unless I do something really completely stupid, more than likely it's no more stupid than what you did when you were a kid too. Complete and perfect memory. Number two, ageless work. You know, because the work-life expectancy and the life expectancy are so out of sync, it's clear to me that within probably a decade, if not less, it'll just be absolutely typical for us to expect that we're going to work in perpetuity. Third trend, what I call every nurship. Everyone becomes an entrepreneur. I mean, it's tough to find someone today who's not in some way utilizing the cloud uh, and, and leveraging it to their own benefit. And I think this is a great thing. I think this creates a whole new era of, of enterprise uh, that we're just beginning to, uh, to appreciate.